Let's stand together as we sing. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and
welcome to Williamsville Christian Church today. Uh, my name is Andrew, and it's a pleasure to be here to worship with you guys. We're going to sing another song that, you know, the last song we sang said, we have an unstoppable God, and what he does is he makes ways where we don't see one, and that's what he does. It's, it's something that sometimes we don't understand and can't comprehend, but he does it, and even when we don't see it and we don't feel it, he's there doing his thing. So we're going to sing about that now.
That is who you are. You are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. We never stop, we never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle worker.
Please be seated. As you read through the book of Acts, you see how the church gets started and all these thousands of people accepting Christ and the church begins and you get to chapter 4 and 5 and you see that things are going so well that they're one, they're a community, they are a family, that they are working so well together that in fact nobody had a need because when a need arose that people that had houses or property would go sell it and give the money to the apostles and they would distribute as needed. So there was no need in this one time uh, Joseph came and sold this piece of property and gave all the money to the apostles to be used. Well, I guess there was this couple, Ananias and his wife Sapphira, decided they had some property, they want to sell it. <clears throat> and they did. But they decided between themselves that they would give part of the money to the apostles, to the church, and keep part of it. But claim they had given it all to them. And so Ananias comes in first to the apostles, gives them money, and, and they said, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why would you lie to God? And he dropped dead. About three hours later, his wife comes in, and she's asked, is this the amount of money that you guys sold the property for? Yeah, it is. And she dropped dead. Now, you got to understand, he explained to him, he said, you know, the property was yours, you sold it, the money was yours. It was yours to do with. So he could have given whatever he wanted. But the point was he claimed that he had given everything to God and he hadn't. You see, they fell dead not because they didn't give everything, they fell dead because they lied to God. They thought they were just lying to the apostles, but the point was they're lying to God. They thought they were given to the apostles, but they were giving to God. And sometimes I forget, we think we're giving to the church, to a group of people. No, we are giving to God. We are dealing with God direct when we deal with giving, when we deal with worshiping, because giving is part of worship, and we're here to worship our God. Now, yeah, fear hit the church. I mean, if somebody came up here and dropped dead in front of you, that put fear in you. But the church still grew. God is serious about his church. He's serious about our relationship with him. And we need to take it serious and realize it's about our hearts. God is concerned about our hearts and our relationship with him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are here this morning to worship you because of your love you have given to us, because of what you have done for us, because you sent your son into this world to die for our sins. And we need to focus on that this morning in our worship. It's about you, your love, your forgiveness, your mercy and grace you've given to us. And help us to give all that we have, all that we are in our time and our efforts and our skills and all that's given to us to realize it's yours for us to use and to bless others with so that they may know about your son Jesus and the love you two had for each and every person in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. help us in their inner hearts. The angels are right here and Jesus is in the middle. Where does Jesus live? Right there. Right where? Right there. On the floor? Uh -huh. Some of the Ten Commandments are? Do not punch, do not lie, do not kick, do not spit. What do you think God looks like? Mm, so tall. Colin, can you explain sanctification? And what does God do all day? He, he stays in our hearts all day. How old is God? 100. Can you tell me how old you think God is? <laughs> Why did they eat an apple? Because they wanted to eat something to eat. How many commandments are in the Ten Commandments? How many numbers? Four. <laughs> do you know what happened to Adam and Eve? They ate. 
a snake. <laughs> you want to tell me the story of Samson? He died. Somebody cut his hair and he, he wasn't strong anymore. Why did his hair give him strength? Because he was big like a grown up. How did uh, Moses give the Ten Commandments? He worked up for really tall island. I have a toy beat and I have a toy bell. Is that story in the Bible? Yeah. What book of the Bible is it? Is that story in? Um, a princess one. Do you know the story about Adam and Eve? Uh -huh. They died. Because they were super, 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 super old. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't preach the gospel to them. Tell them about Jesus. I, I'm sure you probably heard of the popular little story about um, the pastor that before he would do his sermon, he'd have a children's sermon where he'd call all the kids up and he'd sit down and he'd give them a little children's message that related to the message he was about to preach. And this one particular Sunday, he calls them all up and he's sitting on the stairs and all the kids of all ages are surrounding him. And, and he looks at him and he says, okay, kids, what's the name of the creature, the little creature that lives in trees? And he paused. And he paused and he waited for an answer, but Nobody raised their hands. It was just silent. So he thought he'd help him out a little more. He says, you know, this little creature that lives in trees, it, it eats nuts. And again, he paused. And again, silence. He thought, well, I'll help him. Okay, well, let's give it a little before. Sometimes this creature that lives in trees and eats nuts, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's gray, but mostly it's brown and has a real fuzzy tail. And again, he paused. And again, just like this, dead silence, nothing. And it jumps from branch to branch. Some of them can fly, and, and, and it chatters and flips its tail when it's an excited. And another pause, quietness. And the preacher's thinking to himself, what, are, what other clues can I give, the, give these kids to help them understand what I'm trying to do? And finally in the back, they're sitting on the floor. This little boy raises his hand kind of timidly, and, and the preacher's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And he calls them, and he says, well, pastor, he says, I'm pretty sure the creature that you're describing is a squirrel, but we're in church, so I think the answer is Jesus, you know? And, and I love that, and I love that simple illustration. It is so simple when it comes to it, but here's the thing. It's funny, it's simple, but that's what I want us to understand as we gather here this morning. When it comes to responding to people's questions, the answer is always Jesus. It's always Jesus. The church has often told Christians they need to, yes, preach the gospel when they have the opportunity. You've heard me stand up here and encourage you and challenge you to share your faith. And as we started this series off, I mentioned, though, that can be a terrifying thing. That can cause our palms to sweat. That can get our heart beaten when we think about it because of not having the understanding of what it means to, to, to share and, and, or, or what does it mean to preach the gospel. I mean, what does it actually mean to preach the gospel? Paul said in, in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. He describes himself as somebody who has been set apart for the gospel. And then he goes on to explain what the gospel is. He says, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, ha who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. All of that to say the gospel is the story of Jesus Christ. It's his, as the church calls it, his messianic credentials. I mean, we're used to credentials. You know, we, we'll, we'll get a piece of paper. We'll go to college. We'll go to a class. We'll go to a seminar, whatever. They give us this thing and say, okay, here's your credential that shows that you know that you're able to stand up, you're able to do this, you're able to work or whatever, and we get these credentials that allow us to be able to do it. And that's what the Gospels, they're the credentials that let us know because like the divinic line, they talk about Christ coming from the line, they, were, they, they followed, they traced back their family because that was massively important. Here's his credential through Scripture, here's all these different things, and here's the, the Scriptures, the Gospels become his credential that he is who he says he is. And in fact, every time when it comes to Paul, Every time Paul explains his use of the term gospel, he does so by recounting the life of Jesus Christ. And if you read Paul's lengthy evangelistic sermons, especially the one that you find in Acts 13, I'm not going to read it all for you. It's from Acts 13, 16 to 39. I encourage you to do that. But where he is literally preaching the gospel, the focus is, there is on the events of the life of Jesus. He talks about his birth. He talks about him being raised. He talks about his teaching. He talks about his miracles. He talks about his death, burial, and resurrection. And even when he doesn't have a lot of time, even when there's not a lot of space for a lengthy retelling of his story, he summarizes it like he did in Romans 1 or like we read in 2 Timothy 2.8, where he said, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. So according to Paul, the gospel, it's, it's you, know, you know, we have things today where we go out and we have the four spiritual laws, we have the Roman road, we have the thing called, you know, the bridge uh, life illustration. I don't know if you've ever heard that where, you know, you, you kind of draw a road and there's a gap, like a canyon gap, and, and then the cross comes down and the cross becomes the bridge that connects us to Christ. 
Uh, nothing wrong. All those can be used and have been used and, and, and can be tools that we can use. But for Paul and that, it's all about Jesus, his claim to the eternal, to the eternal throne. To be able to sit there, you know, his, his embodiment of the presence of God's kingdom and his invitation for us to enter into that kingdom and to receive that blessing and embrace that blessing in our life, to have, you know, that atonement for the sins in our life so we can spend an eternity with him instead of not and his status as the risen Lord and the coming king. So when I say don't preach the gospel, Okay, I, I, it's kind of a play on words I did here a little bit, so you can just maybe think about it a little different. So when I say, don't preach the gospel, just tell them about Jesus, here's the thing. When you start to tell them about Jesus, you're sharing the gospel with them. And they're understanding the gospel and what it's about. And see, we need to become so familiar with the stories in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they just kind of roll off our tongue when people ask us, why, why is it? Why is it we do what we do? Why is it you have those people over for dinner? Why is it when the pastor gives you homework assignment of blessing three people throughout the week? You thought I was going to forget, didn't you? About blessing three people and going out and maybe inviting somebody over for a meal or, or something along those lines. Why is it you invite that? Why do you go on that mission trip? So when people ask, you know, we, we have this answer. Billy Graham, I love the way he put it. Uh, he says, Christians need to be marinated in the gospel so they can share any part of the story as occasions call for. Who loves marinated meat? Any in here? Okay, come on. Come on. Okay, who marinates their meat? Well, not those that like marinated meat. I'm just curious when it comes to that. I love teriyaki sirloin. Sirloin is my favorite cut of meat. I don't know why I can have it with there, but I love teriyaki sirloin. You know, and, and, but I can grill a sirloin over here, plain. And, and, and stuff, and I love it, but then when I marinate it in teriyaki, that, that, that marinade sauce, just that teriyaki sauce just gets in there. When I cut into it, the flavor's there, and that's what Billy Graham's saying. We need to, when you marinate it, you soak it in there, that, that when I bite into it, that's what comes out, that flavor, that we, we are so soaked in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we are so soaked our lives within that, that when people come to us, that that's just what they're getting. That's the taste of what they're getting. Christ, not us, but Christ. I love that illustration. So don't preach the gospel, preach Christ. Secondly, don't focus on their sin. Focus on Jesus' kingship. You'll notice that none of Paul's gospel sharing focuses on telling people that they're sinners, okay? I mean, if there's anything, like in Romans 1, Acts 13, and 2 Timothy 2, if there's anything all three of these passages focus on, it's Jesus' kingly rule. So when people ask you why you live as you do, our goal, your goal should be to let them know it's because of the example of the teachings of of Christ. Uh, David Botch, he writes this, the mission of God's people is to alert others to the universal reign of God. And what he means by that is, if we believe that Jesus reigns as king, Lord of Lord, King of Kings, as we call him, if we believe his kingdom is the realm where reconciliation takes place, where, where justice is found, where beauty and wholeness is made, then we should not only demonstrate that by the way we live our lives, it should be the conversation that flows from us. Learn the stories of Jesus and how he both announced and demonstrated the kingdom. So like I just said, when people ask you why you're committed, why, why do you do that? Why do you have those people over? Why are you helping the hungry? Why are you going on this trip? Why are you sacrificing? Why are you giving up two weeks of your vacation to go do this? Why, why, why? You can tell them. These are expressions of the world that Jesus taught us to live, but even more importantly, they're expressions of the world that Jesus is bringing, the way that we are to love and the love that will be there. And I don't want you to be disturbed that I said at the beginning not to focus on people's sin. Okay, because if I'm focused on sharing Jesus the way that I'm supposed to share Jesus, if we're focused on sharing Jesus the way we're supposed to, it's going to lead people to question their own lives. That's the job of the Holy Spirit to bring the conviction. Not mine, not yours. We just share. I mean, Paul ends up talking about it. Yes, I told you about that sermon in Acts 13. At the very end, this is what he says. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you are not able to attain under the law. So he ends up addressing the sin, but he starts with Jesus. So after preaching from 16 to 37, he ends up and, you know, anchoring it in, in the historical events of Christ, the life, death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So don't focus on their sin so much. Focus on the kingship. And the last thing, don't focus on church. 
Focus on purpose. I know you've probably never heard me preach about purpose here before. Uh, you know, not the church. I mean, ever since God created man and woman, there has been a struggle with understanding what our life looks like each and every day. We question, you know, what's our purpose? Well, what's the will of God for my life? Those questions have been around. I mean, you know, you look through the Old Testament and you see in the Old Testament that God chose the Jews, you know, to be his chosen people. We have Israelites that are there. And, and, you know, he had his way that he wanted to do it, but they were demanding a leader. They were demanding laws. They were demanding they want to do it. So he said, fine. And he gives them the Ten Commandments, right? He gives them the Ten Commandments that's there. And the, the Jews are like, that's it? Ten? That ain't enough. There's got to be more that we have to do to, to get to God, to get to heaven, to spend it. There has to be. And so you read through the Old Testament and you see we end up like 613 laws. Mosaic laws of, 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 of what man says. You know, if you're going to be a good Jew, this is what a good Jew does. This is what a Jew goes out. This is the law that the Jew follows. And we get focused on the law. But thankfully Christ comes and, and fulfills all that and does away and he starts the church. And he says, look at church, this is what I want you to do with your life. I want you to go out and I want you to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now go, be the church. And man says, there's got to be more. (laughs) It can't be that. You know, it's not necessarily easy, but there's got to be more to it. And so we have to come up with ways that we think of what the church should look like and, and what the church should go out and be, and we forget the purpose. And, and so we create these laws. And, and the funny thing is, these are laws that are on governmental books. Because there used to be a time that the government would sit around, whether it be like in our Williamsville or Sherman surrounding in our little village meetings, or whether it would be at the state level or the federal, whatever, they would actually sit down and look to the Bible to guide them. And the Bible, as they they read through the Bible, that would create the laws that they have on books. And even in these small communities, so there are still laws that are on books today about what church should do, church people should do. It's hilarious if you ever get out there and read it. I've read some for you. For you in the past, I want to read again here uh, uh, from uh, the book called The Door by Robert Pelton. Here's some laws that are still on governmental books today. Young girls are never allowed to walk a tightrope in Wheeler, Mississippi, unless it's in a church. I don't know why it has to be in. Maybe it's because if they fall and die, they're in church. It's a straight road to heaven. I don't know, but hey, it's still on the books in Blackwater, Kentucky. <laughs> Uh, every time I read this one, I laugh. I don't know why. Tickling a woman under her chin with a feather duster while she's in church service carries a penalty of 10 bucks and a one-day jail sentence. I'd probably think of my youth, I'd have gotten a lot more trouble than that, you know, from what I did being in church. Or how about this one? Very specific. You can eat, or no one can eat unshelled roasted peanuts while attending church in Ha, Oregon. In Honey Creek, Iowa, no one's permitted to carry a slingshot in the church except the police, okay? No no citizens in Lee Creek, Arkansas are allowed to attend church in any red color garment or swinging a yo-yo in church or anywhere in public on the Sabbath is prohibited in Studley, Virginia. I mean, it's just not studly on, on to do that on the Sabbath. I don't know. Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of a local church at any time in Slaughter, Louisiana. And the list goes on and on and on of these laws that were created for us to go out and be the church. This is what you're supposed... You have to understand this is what they say we thought the church was. And again, theologian Dave Bosch, he, Bosch, he wrote this. At its heart, the gospel is news about God's action and His reign, not His institution. And a lot of the times, we get caught up on the institution part of it. We get caught up with it, for example, we'll fall into those traps of, of wanting to tell everybody. And, and I hear my heart when I say this. You know, wanting to tell everybody how great our church is. I, I want you to love WCC. I want you to take your gifts, talents, and ability and plug them into WCC and be excited about that and love that and work with the family. I love this family. I love it so much. I've been around almost 19 years here and that I love the WCC family, but I think a lot of the times we find ourselves feeling like we have to be recruitment officers for the church. And then also at times it can be really, really tempting when people ask us questions. They come to us and what do they do? They ask us questions about the church, or more specifically, about the mistakes that the church has made. 
Some of them, they'll go all the way back to the Crusades. This is why I don't go to church. Do you know what happened in the Crusades? Yeah, I studied it in history class and Bible college and stuff like that. Yeah, it wasn't good. Yeah, I didn't like it either. I don't, you know, but, but, but they'll do that. Or they might get a little bit modern, you know, and they'll, they'll start talking about all the things that the abuses that's happening in churches today and the wrongs that they have. And this is why. And, and, and for some reason, when that happens, we, we feel like we have to be the Lord. We feel like we have to be the ones to stand up and defend the church. But genuine gospel ministry is about just simply pointing people to Jesus. Instead of me, you know, giving some long-winded speech on church programs, you know, they can have their place, they have their time, they can be wonderful, God can use them, and have brought thousands of people to church, that's great. Or defending the actions of other Christians. My friends, we're imperfect people in an imperfect world. Christians will make mistakes. The difference is we're not supposed to use it as an excuse. I'm not supposed to say, well, I know God's a God of love. And because God's a God of love, God's, I'm going to go ahead and do this because I know God will forgive me because that's God and God loves me. No, that's not being a Christian. That's just making an excuse so I can do what I selfishly want to do. But every day I'm to try to be like Christ. Some days I'll make it. Some days I'll be closer than others. But I, instead of trying to defend that, I focus on sharing Jesus and how he changed my life and your life. How many times have you heard me say, sharing is just a three-step three step simple process. Step one, this is my life without Jesus. This is what I did. This is what I believe. This is how I acted. Step two, I got introduced to Jesus. I don't know what it might, maybe you came to church. Maybe somebody invited you to a men's or women's conference uh, or a, you know, event or you started having a one-on-one. And, and step two, I heard about Jesus. I heard about who he was and I realized that's who I needed. Step three, I gave my life, made him my Lord and Savior. And now this is how my life has changed. This is what I believe. This is what I do. Steps one, two, and three, that's what I share with people today because God created this world according to his great purposes and yep Satan came in and tried to mess it up but Jesus took our punishment he conquers evil and he brings forgiveness and he defeats death and that's what we share that's what we share and to be excited in the way we share about it Michael Frost he tells a story of when him and his family went to Cocoa Beach on vacation they're sitting out there and, and, and they're, you know, watching and just, you know, sunbathing and playing in the ocean and everything. And, and he's watching, Michael's watching these surfers, these young guys, they're surfing and they're doing really good. And he's interested, they've caught his attention and, and he's watching them surf and have a great time out there surfing. And then they come in and, and they're not too far on the beach from where he is. And he's listening to their surfer lingo and their conversations and that, what they're talking about. And, and he decides... He's going to strike up a conversation with these young surfers. And so he starts talking to them, of course, about surfing. Hey, you guys are pretty good, you know, and uh, how long have you been doing it? And so forth and so on. And, and, you know, and they're excited to talk about it and they're enjoying talking. And then he asks them a question. He says, hey, who do you think is the best surfer around? Without a beat, they said, this guy right here, Kelly Slater. <laughs> Kelly Slater definitely is. And he started to tell them why, because he was crowned the world surfing champion a record 11 times including five consecutive times straight in a row, they said, from 94 to 98. He was the youngest at age 20, and he was the oldest at age 39 to win the title. And Michael said he was just impressed about how enamored they were with this Kelly Slater. So he continued to talk to them, continued to ask questions. And he says, can you tell me a little bit more? And he says, like opening the floodgates of a dam. And these kids just overwhelmed him with statistical information about Kelly's. Hey, he's born right here, dude. And you know, he's right here in Cocoa Beach, California, or Cocoa Beach, California, Cocoa Beach, Florida. You know, his boards that he uses are called Channel Island surfboards. And he uses them because they help him turn like this and do this and all this other kind of stuff. They, they started listing all of his awards way too many that I can list here. They started listing all the shows and commercials and TV ads and everything that, that he had been in. Again, way too many for me to list here. They started listing even all the models and movie stars that he had dated. Again, way too many for me to be here. And Michael said as he was listening to these kids and watching the way they were telling him, a thought just came to the back of his mind. He said, what if I was at home right now? What if I was at home and my neighbor or family member or a coworker or something came up to me and said, Hey, Michael, you go to church and you believe in this guy, Jesus. Can you tell me about Jesus? Who is he? What, what would I say? What would I say? How would I say it to them? And then later on, he was writing in an article and, and, and Michael Frost wrote this. 
When we live, as we're talking about this questionable, when we live questionable lives, people should see our strange behavior and ask us about our motivations. And then we should be able to speak about Jesus the way surfers, those surfers would speak about Kelly Slater with energy and enthusiasm, with reverence and awe, with delight and wonder. Have you ever thought about that? How do we speak about Jesus? When people come and ask you questions, are you terrified you're going to get asked a question? Why? Are you excited? See, my friends, we're getting ready to come up to what we call the table. We're getting ready to what we, what we call here have communion, what the Scripture talks about communion. We're getting ready to go before these elements that represent something that is just an awe to us. Sometimes it can be really hard for us to understand that there is this God that created everything we know in this universe, but He had such an unconditional love with us more than anything we know in this universe with us, that he was sent his one and only son to come down here and to try to get us to reconnect with him. So much to the point that he loved us so much that he would let his one and only son die for us. That's an unconditional love that's hard to wrap our mind around, is it not? That there's that kind of love that God would have for us. That just puts us in awe sometimes and and, in a wonderment. But not only that, we look at Jesus and we look at the life that he had and we look at the life that we can have because, because he says, look it, I'm, I'm, I'm gone now. We talked about this three weeks ago. I'm gone now, but I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you a comforter. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is going to be with you to guide, lead, and direct and empower you in your daily life. You don't have to have any more worry. Remember the series we just did? You don't have to have any more concerns and that your hope is in Christ. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and I can stand up here all day with it. And, 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 and so the enthusiasm and the excitement, where is that? And as we gather here around this table, as you gather and remember that that's what these elements stand for, and they represent that we can have in our daily walk, our daily life, each and every day with God, and that allow His Holy Spirit right now to speak to you. Is that what you have? I mean, if you walk out of here right now and your coworker or your schoolmate or, or your friend or whatever, and in some case, you went to church today. Tell me about Jesus. What would you say? Could you rattle off enthusiastically all these statistics about God and who? I mean, could you tell him one, two, three? Could you, what would that look? And here, I want, I want you to be clear on this, okay? Because I've sat out where you sat, and I've been to like Iron Sharpens, Iron's Promise Keepers, these men's conferences, and sometimes these guys will stand up there, and when we talk about sharing our faith in evangelism, and they make it sound like it's bad to have hobbies, it's bad to like sports, and, and I, if you've got a hobby that you like, and you like doing, that's great. I'm not saying it's wrong. If you can tell somebody how to take a car apart down to the last bolt and put it back together, good for you. There's nothing wrong with that. If you like other football teams other than New Orleans Saints, that's okay. You know, I mean, Jesus still loves you. I'm working on it, but Jesus still loves you. And, and it's okay to know the statistics of those players in any sport that you have, you want to do, whatever is that's out there. If you have those things, that's fine. We're just not supposed to have them above God, above Christ. We're just supposed to know Him and want to share Him more. It's not that there's not times that you can't be excited to have fun with those things. But we want to make sure that we're also understanding the love letters that He's left us, that we call the Scriptures, we call the Bible, and what they mean for us, and how He wants to be there each and every day for us. That we understand that, hey, I can help with this, or you know, that God is there and wants to help guide and lead and direct no matter what's happening, and that there's a world that needs to know that and to understand that. So as we come before these elements today, as we get ready to gather, if you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, the, we have four different spots where we have the communion. The communion is set up where it's just simply there's two cups that are together. The bottom one has a little wafer. The top has the juice. Uh, when you're ready, while the worship team is playing, you can come forward. Please help with the social distancing. Come forward and you can take that. You can either take it while you're there and then throw it in the trash can or you can take it back to your seats while you just take some more time to think and let God's, God speak to you however you want to, want to do that. But let's just spend some time right now. Let's just go before God in prayer and, and spend some time and let His Holy Spirit speak to us. Father.
I thank you for the moments that we have right now. I thank you for this opportunity that we could gather today and be in your presence, to come together, to celebrate, to come together, to worship, to sing, to come together at this table, to hear your word and to be reminded how much you love us, that love that is hard for us to wrap our minds around, Heavenly Father, to, to, to be reminded, Lord, that you do have that love, but also, Father God, that you do, Father God, want us to be sharing that love, want us to go out and be that light. Forgive us. Forgive us when we forget how much passion and love and mercy you have for us, but not just us, but for everybody, Lord. Forgive us, Father God, when we let fear get in the way, Lord. But I pray, Father God, that you'll just speak to our hearts now as we just celebrate and give thanks for the gift of your Son, that you'll speak to our hearts and help us understand what steps maybe we need to take today so we can go out and not be fearful of being asked a question, but be excited and enthusiastic to share with people around, Lord so they can know and they can understand and they can have that same joy, Lord. Thanks so much for this time, Lord Jesus, as we just gather here this morning. Speak to our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of being here this morning in your presence to worship you, to, to hear your word, to sing to you, to know how much you love us because you gave your son up for us. And we were here to thank you and praise you. And we just pray that you send us out with your Holy Spirit, that we live the life that you want for us, that you designed for us, to show Jesus to the people around us in everything we do and say. And we just pray that we present you, we represent you in this world as we leave this place. Thank you for all you do for us and all that you give to us. In Jesus' name, amen.